praised are you, Adonai, God, King of the universe, who gives the Torah of truth and the good news of salvation to his people Israel, to all the people through his son Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, dokie. I think we got to like verse 1 or 2 on Acts 20. Shall we go back? Acts 20, what did we touch on last week? What is the first thing we did? We spoke about blasphemy. It was a plot by the Jews against Paul. Blasphemy. What does that mean? What did we try to figure out there? I mean, we're never really going to know. According to the word, if we sort of bounce around quite a lot of scriptures, we can sort of try to figure it out. But whether it's 100%, we don't know. What's blaspheming the Holy Spirit? We don't really know, but what we kind of figured out was, what? It's when you hate the Word of God. When you've figured out the power of the Word of God, you've given your life to Yeshua, you've learned about God, you know what He likes, what He doesn't like, and then you turn around and you say, no, not for me. That's what we kind of figured it out. It's when you hate the Word of God and you have no regard for it at all. And then we spoke about Paul missing Passover. We try to reconcile that. Um, we looked at Havdalah. Who remembers Havdalah? Havdalah. What is Havdalah? Welcoming in the new week. Yes, yeah, so ending off Shabbat on a Saturday night, having a little wine or grape juice as we do it. Have a little spice. You smell the spice because it's sweet, symbolic of the word, symbolic of Shabbat. If you take a normal breath, it's just normal air. It's symbolic of any other day of the week. Um, and then you welcome in the week and you just sit around the table. And this is what the early believers would have done. They would have welcomed in Shabbat. And then they probably would have gone into, as Vince actually touched on last week, it was actually a good point. What they most likely did was then go through and spoke about Yeshua. Okay, this is the Lord's Day. Let's, let's talk about it. This is the day that Yeshua was resurrected. Let's, let's discuss. Shabbat, they probably focus on the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, the Torah, the writings, and the prophets. Prophets and writings. And then on Saturday night and on Sunday, which is Sunday, they would have probably focused on gospel writing. And then we started... What verse was it? Verse 7 is where we got up to. It says, On the evening of Shabbat, or on day 1 of 7, when we were gathered to break bread, Shaul addressed them. And we started going into Shabbat. And we're probably going to get stuck here again tonight. Shabbat. We wanted to answer a couple of key questions. Can anyone remember what those were? What was the first one we, we, we answered? Was the Sabbath changed to a Sunday? Who can remember what we spoke about? Yes, Romans are in everything. <laughs> you can say Romans at any point in the New Testament, you'll probably be right. <laughs> yeah? Who changed it specifically? Yeah. I think that's the date. What was it that? 321 AD. Constantine named himself the bishop of the Catholic Church and enacted the first civil law regarding Sunday observance. And he said something along the lines of, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and the people residing in the cities rest. Because they wanted nothing to do with the Jewish people, so they separated it to the Sunday. And they thought, okay, you know what? We understand the importance of the Sabbath. Let's still try to keep it. But let's not keep it with those Jewish people. Because they're just weird. And they killed the Messiah. So we're going to do it on the Sunday and that's going to be cool. So we figured that out. Then we looked at the Council of Laodicea, which is where a bunch of clergymen, church elders got together from Asia Minor in about 364 AD uh, in Phrygia. And they sat down and they came up with a bunch of Roman Catholic decrees. And one of them was 
outlawing the keeping of the Sabbath on a Saturday and encouraging rest on the Sunday. They also wanted to regulate approach to heretics, Jews and pagans, enforcing modest behavior of clerics and lay people. They specified a bit of biblical canon as well. They gave admission and instruction of catechumens and neophytes. What the heck is that? I had to look it up. A catechumen is someone receiving instruction for a baptism. And a neophyte is a new convert. So they had to come up with the instructions. What do we do with these people? What do we, when we admit them, when we bring them in, what do we do with this? This was, this was just a bunch of stuff that they were doing in the Council of Laodicea. One of the things that they did was no more Saturday, let's do it on Sunday. So we kind of tackled that and then we got stuck there and we got lost there and we're now going to answer the next question. Is anyone unsure about that? About what we did last week? Is anyone unsure? Any questions so far? No. Good. Next question we're going to answer. Is the Sabbath only for the Jews? No. I thought it was. But let's have a look. So, we need the Bible to define the Bible. So let's figure out exactly who the Sabbath was spoken to. Let's go to Exodus 19. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that now. Exodus 19, verse 1 to 6. It says... In the third month after the people of Israel had left the land of Egypt, the same day they came to the Sinai Desert. After setting out from Rephidim and arriving at the Sinai Desert, they set up camp in the desert. There in front of the mountain, Israel set up camp. Moshe went up to God, and Adonai called to him from the mountain. Here is what you are to say to the people of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on the eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will pay careful attention to what I say, and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you will be a kingdom of priests for me, a nation set apart. These are the words you are to speak to the people of Israel. So, it says you yeah, are the people of Israel, right? Seems a bit wobbly. It says the people of Israel. And later on we actually see it says to the descendants of Jacob. And the household of the people of Israel. Why two people? Why does he say the descendants of Jacob and the household of Israel? Says here, say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. He distinguishes them. There's two groups of people. The descendants of Jacob, or the physical descendants of Jacob. They came from his lineage. Blessed lineage. They're the physical seed. The people of Israel, they're also those people. They're also the descendants of Jacob, but... As Richard said, what we see when they come out of Israel, there's two times it mentions in the Torah, a mixed multitude was with the Israelites. A mixed multitude. Why? A mixed race be with them. Okay? Now again? Because people came with when he brought them out of Egypt. Yes. That's exactly it. So, if you were to see the plagues and wonders in Egypt and you were an Egyptian, would you side with the Israelites? I think by the time darkness came for three days, and it says that they found darkness, I think that was when I would have started walking to the light. I'm done with this Egyptian stuff. I'm heading to the light. Mixed multitude came out. How do we know that for certain though? Vanessa. Caleb wasn't a descendant of Jacob. What was Caleb? 
It's more specifically, a Kenazite. We don't particularly know who the Kenazites were, but they were definitely not from Jacob. So Caleb went and aligned himself to the people of Israel and said, you know what, your God, I, I, I will have your God, thank you very much for coming. That we know for certain. Caleb was a Kenazite and he attached himself to Israel. Which brings us to a particularly interesting passage as well, which sort of is very similar to this. If you have a look, it's the New Covenant, right? What does the New Covenant state? Who is the New Covenant meant for? If you go to Jeremiah 31 or Ezekiel 36, it tells you. It says, let's read. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Just who it's for. Jeremiah 31, 31. <clears throat> yours, yeah, yours should be 31. It says here, Here the days are coming, says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant. New or renewed. Don't, don't really get lost on that, okay? New or renewed, either way. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So now all of a sudden we have the house of Israel, which is the people of Israel. Those words are interchangeable. House of Israel and the house of Judah. That's very interesting. Why the house of Judah? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. The kingdom split. Judah left behind. Levi, Simeon, these guys were left behind. That was all that was left. When Assyria came down, wiped out the ten northern tribes, took them and scattered them throughout the world and assimilated them into their nations. That's why it's called the ten lost tribes of Israel. They are lost. We don't know where they are. They don't even know where they are. That's when Assyria came down, they took people from up and put them in that area that they conquered in Israel and made them intermingle and interbreed with a little bit of Israelites that were left there. And they became the Samaritans. And that's exactly why you have Yeshua coming up to that Samaritan lady and saying, no longer will you worship on this mountain, he was pointing to Mount Gerizim, or in Jerusalem. You have to ask yourself, why was he saying that? What are they doing worshiping on that mountain? The Samaritans kept a, their own Torah. They kept a copy of their own Torah when all of that happened. And they started getting assimilated with other cultures and raised with Assyrians. And they started taking on a bit of a new identity. And their Torah actually changed. They literally changed it. There's, there's, I think there's 6,000 differences in their Torah versus what we have here. You can, you can actually get the Samaritan Torah online. There's, there's quite a lot of differences. There's a few major differences, but there's a lot of small differences. And that's why the Jewish people... the Judahites, the Jewish people, started disliking the Samaritans because they're changing everything. They worship on Mount Gerizim. They believe that's where the, the temple should have been. So they start worshiping on Mount Gerizim. The Jewish people, the Judahites, and whoever's left after Assyria comes down, before Babylon completely eradicates the, the place, they're worshiping in Jerusalem. And Yeshua's walking through here as well. And he's like, even after the the Babylon, Babylonians came, you have this split still, and he says to her, you're not going to worship on this mountain anymore. You're not going to worship in Jerusalem. You're going to be the temple. God's going to send a comfort. God's going to send a spirit. That's what he was saying. Okay? So we have the house of Judah and the house of Israel again. So Judah is the Judahites, what was left. Okay? Because everyone else got lost. Israel is what's important to us. We are not physical descendants. As far as I know, and I don't know about you guys, but as far as I know, I'm not a physical descendant of Jacob. I do not have those documents. And I don't have a document for Abraham. I don't have any documents along those lines. I'm not related to Ruth. I don't know. As far as I know, I'm not there. So this, for me, is all important and all encompassing because it says the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's who the new covenant is for. So how do we fit in then? And this is something we need to ask ourselves as young believers, 
to understand New Covenant Scripture. And as mature believers, we need to be able to firmly say in our foundation, what is New Covenant and how does it apply to me? Well, that's why we have Paul, right? So Paul, let's go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 11 and 13. Listen to this. <clears throat> Therefore, remember your former state, you Gentiles by birth. So, Gentiles. Anyone who's a Gentile in a Jewish mindset is someone that doesn't have covenant. Someone not from Abraham. That's a Gentile. When Yeshua went from one side of the lake to the other side to get to Legion, he was physically going to the Gentile side of the lake. The Decapolis, ten cities on that side. One was in Israel, and that was Bet Sheon or Scythopolis. I've been there, massive Roman city. He literally went from one side of the lake to the other side to reach the Gentiles. And the interesting there, thing there was he reaches legion, he casts out those demons into pigs. So that should already tell you if he's casting out demons in pigs, it's not a Jewish settlement. They don't eat pig. How many demons were in that man? More or less? 2,000. About 2,000. We know that because the, in one of them, in one of the scriptures, I think it's Mark, it says 2,000 pigs on the hillside. And the demons went out into those, ran down into the water, into chaos. Yeah. Interesting. But it's a picture. God going over the chaos, the water, Sea of Galilee, to reach the Gentiles, which the Jewish people never wanted to touch with a stick. I mean, I can just imagine the, the apostle sitting on that boat going, there's a funny man running towards us who's ripping chains off of himself, full of scratches, screaming, Yeshua, son of God most high, what do you want with me? I would have jumped in that boat and started paddling back to Jewtown if I was one of those apostles. But God delivers a message there. He saves that man and that man goes back to the Gentile city that was near him. And next time Yeshua comes back, I think it's the feeding of the 4,000. And what was left over was seven baskets of bread for the seven nations, the seven Gentile nations. And that's a message. And he's saying, you know what, the last time he was on the, on the good side of the lake, there were 12 baskets for the 12 tribes the descendants of Jacob. But then he sends over and he's like, you know what, let's go to the Gentiles. And that seven represented the rest of the world, so to speak. So he's saying, I'm not just coming for the descendants of Abraham. I'm coming for the Gentiles. This is not just for you guys. This is for the Gentiles. The salvation is for all, for everyone. So in Ephesians, therefore remember your former state. Logie, did you want to say something, boy? Yes. Yes, he was. Okay. There was a. Therefore, remember your former state, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcised by those who merely, because of an operation on their flesh, are called the circumcised. At that time, had no Messiah. You were estranged from the national life of Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants. I want you to take special note of that. It's not covenant. It's covenants. It's plural. Because in a Hebraic mindset, in an a Israeli's mindset, covenants are built on top of each other. And that's why Paul says in Galatians 3, verse whatever, that no covenant nullifies a covenant of old or a previous covenant. Covenants are built on top of each other, and we'll get to that one day. But he says, you were foreigners to the covenants embodying God's promise, you were in this world without hope and without God, but now you who were once far off have been brought near through the shedding of the Messiah's blood, for He Himself is our peace. He has made us both one and has broken down the division which divided us, the wall of division. So He's saying, because of Ephesians 2, okay, what, what we're saying here, what was that, 11... 11 to 13. We were strangers 
but now no longer. Because of the blood of Messiah, we are brought near to those covenants, to the very covenants that the descendants of Jacob had, to that new covenant. And we can take this a step further with Paul. Paul, the great rabbi, the great teacher. If we go to Romans 11, and we start reading from verse 16. Now, what I want you to take note of as well, is Romans 11 should always have a side sort of note with Jeremiah 11. And you'll see exactly now why. Romans 11 says this. Actually, let's, let me just start with Jeremiah 11. You guys can stay in Romans 11. I'm going to go to Jeremiah 11. And I'm going to read something there for you. Set the stage. <clears throat> okay. Jeremiah 11 verse 16 said, says, Adonai once called you an olive tree, beautiful, full of leaves and good fruit. This is a verse where God, where Jeremiah, through the revelation of God, is stating that Israel is an olive tree that was once full of good fruit. And then you read later, the branches get broken off and whatnot. And you can start picturing stump of Jesse, Messiah coming out, something had to get chopped down, Messiah coming out. So understand, in this context, Israel is the olive tree. Now let's go back to Romans 11, verse 16. Now if the bread offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole loaf. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. I'm just going to make a note here. Holy root equals holy branch. What? Make mindset again. Hmm? Set apart. Okay, so if the root is set apart from what? Yeah, remember when they smelt that sweet smell of those spices on Shabbat, they're going from something holy to something ordinary. But for them it wasn't ordinary anymore. It, was, it became the resurrection day. But it's still set apart root, set apart branches. Okay, now let's draw a little tree. Okay, so this, the Bible tells us through Jeremiah 11, equals Israel, the olive tree. Verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, now remember we're talking to Gentiles, you, a wild olive, that's nice, God calls us a wild olive. I feel very special right now. Why are we wild? Why are we a wild olive? <laughs> what do we use the olive for in Israel? Oil. Okay, they pile it all together, they mill it, they put it in bags, they put it down and they, they have a press. And that first pressing, what is that? Extra virgin. Pours out, they scoop that up, and what is that used for? Okay, yes, first fruits, and also for the menorah. For the menorah and the anointing. And then so on and eventually you just get for the normal people in the house for the lighting and then you see the actual smoke coming from the third press the, that oil from the third pressing it's, it's not as pure as the menorah oil to make the light in the temple so he says we're a wild olive tree now remember god calls this this tree israel now israel is the cultivated olive tree which means it's been pruned and it's all nice and shaped. If you go to Israel today, they are masters at uh, cultivating olive trees, looking after olive trees. They've got some olive trees there, uh, close to the Mount of Olives, that are really old. Really old. Could have seen Yeshua. Could have been around. Okay? Massive trunks like this. But little branches coming off. Yeah? Village. 
Yes, my boy. So God says again, we're the wild olive tree. If you can picture a wild olive tree, it's a scraggly thing that grows in all directions. No one's pruned it. No one's looked after it. It might bear fruit. It might not. If it does bear fruit, it's not going to taste as good as a cultivated olive tree. That's what, he's, that's what he's telling us. He says that we're wild. We haven't been pruned. We haven't been looked after. But now, this is, the, this is the cool part. You, a wild olive, were grafted in among them and have become equal sharers in the rich root of, of the olive tree. So he's saying, God has taken this piece and cut it off and stuck it in here. And what does that mean for that branch? Does it have this root system? No, because it's gone from this. He's removed it and he's put it in here and it's got this root system. The holy root. The root that has been set apart. And now the branch is pulling from that root system. It says here, you are not, listen to this. Verse 18. Then don't boast as if you were better than the branches. However, if you do boast, Remember that you are not supporting the root. The root is supporting you. This root is feeding you. <clears throat> so you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True, but so what? They were broken off because of their lack of trust. So God had removed some branches so that He can put us in. Because they did not trust in Yeshua. However, you keep your place only because of your trust. So don't be arrogant. On the contrary, be terrified. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He certainly won't spare you. So take a good look at God's kindness and His severity. On the one hand, severity towards those who fell off. But on the other hand, God's kindness toward you. Provided you maintain yourself in that kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. Moreover, the others, if they do not persist in their lack of trust, will be grafted in. Because God is able to graft them back in. For you were cut out of what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? So yeah, we see. Okay, that's great. God has taken us Gentiles, removed us from the, the wild tree that we were, Cut us off because of our trust. Plant in to this Israel tree. And this is how we become part of the house of Israel. Is this making sense? Making sense? Jolly good. So you are now part of the house of Israel. You're not a Gentile. If you trust in Yeshua and you put your faith in Yeshua, you are Israel. That is what you are. If a Jewish man comes up to you and says, Ah, you're just a Gentile. You're like, mm -mm, I'm not. I am Israel. And I think this is where the Roman Catholic Church went a little bit pear-shaped. In the beginning, they were like, Oh, we're Israel now. Okay, so they're not Israel anymore. We're the new Israel. This is where things fell apart. And we've, we've looked at that. But I want you to understand that you are Israel just as much as a descendant of Jacob who believes in the Messiah. And we're seeing that. We're seeing Jewish people come to the Messiah. Coming to that revelation. Oh, yes, Daniel's timeline is long gone. Uh, the Messiah must have come at some point. So, let me listen about this Yeshua. Let me put it in line. They would know the Torah. They would know the prophets. They would know the writings. And they would understand the revelation of the Messiah throughout the Old Testament. And it would be so much more real to them than us coming from a New Testament looking back at the Old Testament. But we are the house of Israel. So the new covenant is for us. We form part of the house of Israel. And the house of Judah is those guys from the Jewish people that believe in the Messiah. Now the interesting part about this is, and this is what I want you guys to take note of. If you come from that wild olive tree that was never pruned and never shaped and never loved and never watered and never looked after, and now you become part of this tree that is shaped and pruned and loved and looked after. I mentioned something called pruning. 
sometimes God's going to cut things in your life. And it hurts. Because now we have to stop doing what we were doing. What we were doing in that wild olive tree was things that weren't good for us. But now he's pulled us out of that and things have to change. Remember, we should change. How do you know someone's been filled with the Spirit? Yes, those gifts come. But there's change in their life because the root system is feeding them. God's holy roots, the holy roots of Israel, is coming through and you are going to want to live by His ways. So you are going to change. And those things where you used to go out and party, where you used to go out and drink, where you used to go out and do other things that you really shouldn't do, you're not going to want to do anymore. And when you find yourself doing those things, you're going to be asking yourself, Yo, why did I do that? I know it's bad. I know it's bad. But I do it. This is what Paul, Paul battled. I don't think he battled with the, the hectic things. I think he, he battled. I think Paul was very critical on himself. And he battled with probably a lot of thoughts. But, you know, he said himself, you know, I want to do the things that I should do. But I'll end up doing things that I shouldn't do. I'm wretched. And we feel like that, right? We feel guilty when we do things that we shouldn't do. Because we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. This is why there is a salvation. This is why God sent His Yeshua for us. But over time, as we pull more from this root source, our little branch should start bearing fruit that is worthy of being <laughs> crushed and stuck in a menorah. He said to you, you are the light, you are the salt. That part you are the light is this. Make fruit that is worthy of being the light. So that when people look at you, they can say, Wow, that olive has a lot of anointing on his life. That person, I can see the fruit of God in him. That's what you need to be. And you shouldn't strive for perfection in that sense just to get recognition. You should live by his ways and that will come as a result. Yeah? Yeah, it's lovely, huh? No one said being a believer is easy. Yeshua himself said, you will, you will get persecuted. It's not an easy road. It really isn't. When you start, when you start believing, and you go through your first bap well, your baptism, that testing comes in a big way, massive way. The only thing that's, that gets us through that is a community that has this, that knows what it's like to be pulled out of what we're used to and chucked into a tree that we're estranged to, but yet we feel good in this tree and we feel like we want to change and these nutrients are coming in and God's filling you with that spirit. And that's when you start walking differently and you start thinking differently and you start changing. And that old leather jacket that you used to wear. So I knew this was your friend. That old leather jacket that you used to wear is not so comfortable anymore. No, you're not, no, you're not. This is my jacket, bro, from ten years ago. No, I don't know who this is. But that's the point. That's what needs to happen with your old ways. It mustn't fit anymore. It should, you should chuck it away. Even if it's nice and feels good. Even if it does fit. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah my old ways. Let me go back to my old ways. <laughs> be, be careful. Because the minute you go back to your old ways, the minute that is driven out of you and you allow it back in, you sure had some very scary things to say about that. Then it's going to become seven times as hard. Another nice uh, little verse that I want to read for you is Isaiah 56, verse 67. If you still think that maybe the Sabbath is only for the Jews, listen to this. 56, uh, verse 6 to 7. It says, yeah. And the foreigners who join themselves to Adonai, to serve Him, to love the name of God, and to be His workers, all who keep Shabbat and do not profane it, 
and hold fast to my covenant. I will bring them to my holy mountain and I will make them joyful in the house of prayer. God says, if you join yourself to the house of Israel, to God, and you observe His Shabbat, His Sabbath, He will bring them to His holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Now while we, uh, I just need to talk about what Shabbat is. We've read scriptures on it, right? We know what it is. We know what we should do, what we shouldn't do on a Shabbat. We should do that because we, we want to. But I want to read something for you here. Exodus 31. Let me just get the verse. <clears throat> Here we go. Exodus 31 from verse 12. It says, Adonai said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel, again, tell the people of Israel, You are to observe my Shabbats, for this is a sign between me and you through all your generations. Through all your generations. So that you will know that I am Adonai, who sets you apart for you. Who sets you apart for me. Therefore, you are to keep my Shabbat, because it is set apart for you. Everyone who treats it is as ordinary must be put to death. For whoever does any work on it is to be cut off from his people. Strong language. But what I want to focus on is that sign. It's a sign. It's a sign that's going to set you apart. Just as much as going to church on a Sunday sets you apart already. Right? Oh, you're going to church on Sunday. Oh, you must be a Christian. Yes, in fact, I am. Thank you very much. Then they know who you stand for, right? They know exactly who you serve. He says that if you keep Shabbat, it will be a sign for you. Now, a sign is what? This is a sign of, of my marriage, right? So, if I wear this, you can be assured that I am married. Yes? This is a, it's a physical representation. If I put it here, am I married? No. Yeah, man. If I put it here, I've got some problems. But if I put it here, if I put it here, I'm married. This shows you I have a wife. This shows you that I shouldn't be doing stupid things. This shows you I love somebody. It shows you I have a house. Just like Shabbat is a sign for the people that keep it. Oh, why don't you buy on a Shabbat? Well, you see, well, why don't they'll, they'll ask you. You know, you, you want to come to this concert or whatever on Saturday? And I'm like, no. We can't, it's a Shabbat. Okay? Why? Okay, well, let me tell you why. And then I generally go through all of this. And then they run away. <laughs> but it shows them immediately, just like this does. It shows them immediately who I stand for, right? Just like going to church on a Sunday shows everyone immediately who you stand for. Keeping the Sabbath is the same. It sets you apart. To be set apart is to be different from everyone else. And they're going to ask you questions. And it's going to be like that Abrahamic well, where people came to Abraham for water, and he was like, let me tell you about my God. It's an evangelical tool. God makes things a sign as an evangelical tool. Love it. So that should answer the question of, is the Sabbath only for the Jews? Is there any questions there? Yeah. No, he, look, he will give you favor, but more, more importantly, it's a, it's a sign for you, right? Other people are going to question you, and a lot of people are going to think you're weird. Just like people think you're weird sometimes when you go to church, right? My mom thought I was weird when I went to church. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing what you should be doing, what you should have done with me a long time ago. Don't you give me that tone. Okay. Prima, bye. <laughs> I didn't say favor. No, doesn't, don't expect to have favor just because you keep Shabbat. He does say he's going to give you joy in the house of prayer. 
but you can't expect you can't expect blessings just as much as you can't expect blessings when you give tithe and get a hundred you put one rand get a hundred rand back yeah I know but I know it's not it's not about that it's about because you want to serve God okay you want to make God happy that's what it's about can I rub off here In their, in their understanding, they do. In their understanding, they do. But he should always go back to the word. That's what Yeshua came to get rid of. Oh, okay. Now you're going to man to look for your answers. You need to go back to the word. And, and, and that guy should really study the word. And he should get an answer from God. And he should pray to God and say, you know what? Abba, I'd love to play tennis on a Shabbat. But what does your word say about it? And he's probably going to land up somewhere near my ten and... Zaya, <laughs> can't remember where it's Zaya sixty something. Yeah, that's that's he would have he would have he would have he would have landed up somewhere there, where Zaya was warning the people through God to not pursue their own interests on Shabbat. Because why? Because on a Shabbat. In, in God's eyes, we should be focusing on Him. Okay? And this is, this is the difficult part, Seth, because, you know, when we came, when I came to understand this, the only time that I could play sport was generally on a Saturday because everyone would go to church on a Sunday. Right? And no one would play sport on a Sunday. So, now, for me, for me, I've, I've taken to observe Shabbat. So I had to make a very difficult decision in my life. Okay, I'm not going to do this on Shabbat. I'm not going to do this on Shabbat. I'm not going to do this on Shabbat because it's quite a gray area. So I'd rather spend time, and this is why we do Bible study on, on a Shabbat. Because we, we focus on the Word on Shabbat, and then we go play sport every other day. So it's, it's difficult. It's, it's difficult, and especially for a Jewish guy, it's very difficult. Richard was first. Fifty-six, verse thirteen. Fifty-six, fifty-eight, verse thirteen. Sorry. No, no, fifty-eight. Okay, so now we need to. Sp oh, sorry, Gary. You have to wait for God to open up a door that you don't have to work on a Saturday. It's very difficult to go. Let's say if I hypothetically believe that He doesn't open up the door, die. Then you keep praying. Then you keep praying. That's the difficult thing. So now, if you if you've been convicted to not work on Shabbat, but you got into a position at work prior to your understanding of not working on Shabbat, you're in a difficult position. God's not going to condemn you. He's not going to say, ah, oh, yeah, you see now, I told you about Shabbat and you're not doing Shabbat. No, I'm going to curse you. He's not going to do that. He's going to allow you to slowly get to that point where you can keep Shabbat for him. That's the thing. He's, he's patient. He's merciful. He's kind, right? This is why we have Yeshua. Thank you, Jody. He's patient. So he's going to, you know what? You can't, just as much as we can't expect anyone to learn the entire Bible overnight. We learn it little bit by little bit, chapter by chapter, and things become real to us day by day. And God willing, we grow and we grow and we grow in the strength of God so that when we know about these things, we can slowly work on them and work our way towards them. And God's patient. He's patient. For me, I shut down my company on Shabbat. Friday, 6 o'clock. So Saturday, 6 o'clock, I don't work and nobody in my company is allowed to work. And they're not even keeping. But it says that in the, in the Torah, it says you will, not, you will keep the Shabbat and the foreigner working for you will keep the Shabbat. So I don't want them to break the Shabbat even though they don't, they don't care at all. They, 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 they're like, oh great, I don't have to work on weekends. Because he knows I don't want to work on a Sunday because he goes to church or whatever the case is. So 
generally speaking, on those feast days, we got a, a Shabbat, a, a high feast. Nobody works. That's just the thing as well. If you honor Shabbat and you still go to church on Sunday, when do you go to these things? Shopping and stuff like that. Oh, whenever you're free, though. Sunday afternoon. Sunday afternoon. Remember, Saturday, you're supposed to be resting the whole day. If you're going to follow it correctly, you're resting in His Word. You're resting and you're focusing on Him and you're not shopping. It looks like you literally have a lot of time. Yeah, but you have You have a lot of time. Remember, the creator of the universe gave us a model to work on. Work those six days, but rest on the seventh. In Israel, they work six days. They work six days in Israel. They rest one, and that's the Shabbat. You, you're walking in Israel. I promise you, you can walk in there. Friday at about three o'clock, things start shutting down. Everyone, it's like ghost town. There's nothing happening. No one's driving. If you drive... If you drive in an orthodox town on Shabbat, you better make sure that you drive very fast because those rocks will come flying at you. Yeah. No, no. It's the, company, the country shuts down completely. Country shuts down. And then come Saturday night. Saturday night in, your, in, in Jerusalem. The youngsters. I'm talking like 12 to 20, 23, 24. They come out in busloads. And they're just partying and dancing and going nuts. And, but the girls are all wearing such modest dresses. And they, they, they beha- they're innocent. They're innocent. They're wearing modest dresses. Okay, you get, you get the odd few here and there that you clearly don't care about Torah or God or whatever the case is. You will find the world in, in Jerusalem if you're looking for it. But everyone comes out. Saturday, when, those, when that sun sets and in their tradition, when you see the three stars, it's party time. Out they go, Pff, done, have the love with mom and dad, and we're gone. Pew. Party, party, party. Yeah? Yes, Gabby. You forget. All right. You want to ask, Gabby? Okay. Yeah, no, the, 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 the streets literally vibrate on a Saturday night. They have the music pumping in Jerusalem. They've got massive speakers. They've got things going on and the kids are just having a ball. It's actually really nice to see because it's safe, clean fun. It really is. So now we're going to do the third question. Yo, we're really taking our time. Um, is it abolished? Is it abolished? So let's explore that. Yeah, but then people are going to tell you that it's abolished. Because Yeshua abolished it. So we need, to, we need to look at this. We need to look at this in line with the Word. Let me, let me show you. We're going to be in Matthew 5. Matthew 5 from verse 17. And you're going to read this in a new way. In a Greek and in a Hebraic and it really sheds so much light. What language did Yeshua speak? Just Aramaic. while we're there. Aramaic. Aramaic Greek. Hebrew. Greek. Probably Greek. They believe that when he addressed Pontius Pilate, he was speaking Greek. Yeah? Probably three. Maybe four. Right. <laughs> Zulu, yeah, yeah. Swahili, man. No, no, no. Oh, maybe he was talking in tongues, but you could have been talking in tongues. So four. Okay, verse 17. Listen to this. And this is one of the famous uh, passages. This is on the Sermon on the Mount. On Sermon on the Mount. Remember what just happened before this. What just happened before this, this verse 17? Matthew 5 is about what? Sermon on the Mount. Right. And what does he do? Now he's, it's a sermon. So he's, he's talking to them. He's expounding on the Torah. He says, remember what he says. He says, I... Listen to this. How blessed are those who poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How blessed are those who are meek, for they will inherit the land. There's a lot to go through there, but we're not, we're not going to go through that right now. Let's jump right in. Don't think... 
that I've come to abolish the Torah. Let me just read from an NIV. Who's got it? Mine's very biased. Okay, listen. Wow, this is tiny. Okay, Matthew 5, 17. It says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Okay, so there's our two keywords. Abolish and fulfill. Mine is quite, quite, mine is quite confusing. So, I have come to accomplish the purpose. That's nice. But... Mine is the great version. <laughs> the great version. The great version. Okay, let's focus. Verse 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Well, I truly tell you, until heaven and earth disappear. Have heaven and earth disappeared? Have they? No. It says here, not the smallest letter. What's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet? The Yud. Not the smallest letter or the stroke of a pen. Not a jot or tittle in some translations. This is the Yud. It's a letter. The stroke of a pen is the little thing that sits on top there with the stroke of the pen to make the letter. That's what he's talking about. He's saying not, not the yud or the stroke of a pen will pass from the law until everything is accomplished. Is everything accomplished? Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I truly tell you, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, he's saying, we understand. To get into the kingdom of heaven means we've got to believe, right? So he's saying, whoever teaches against this, will be least. So it'll still be in the kingdom. Great. Just so you know. But whoever practices will be called, called great. What I want to look at is this, because a lot of misunderstanding comes from this. And we're going to look at the Greek, and we're going to look at the Hebrew. Abolish versus fulfill. Now, abolish in Greek is kataliu. I don't know Greek. And Full is playru. Now, if we have a look at the definition of playru and katalu, whatever that is, however you pronounce it, playru says to make full or to fill up, to full to the full, to cause to abound, to furnish or supply liberally, to render full, to fill to the top, to consummate. To make complete, to carry through to the end, or to accomplish, to carry out, to carry into effect, to bring to realization, to realize, to fulfill, i.e. to cause God's will, as made known in the law, to be obeyed as it should be, and God's promises given through the prophets to receive fulfillment. That's the Greek Translation. That's the last one in the Greek translation. Okay. So he's saying he has not come. This is Pleru. To fulfill. We can, we can look at a number of those. And to be quite honest, it's a little bit confusing. If you look at it just from a Greek perspective. That's this word. Greek definition is to dissolve. To disunite. To bring to naught. To subvert or overthrow, to halt on a journey, to put up, to lodge, and so on. There's, a, there's quite a lot there. Um, to deprive, even, or to demolish, or to destroy. So he's saying, I've not come to bring to naught, but I have come to uphold, to fulfill. But I want to put a Hebraic spin on this. 
and I need another color. And I'm going to back it up with with something now. I don't. I don't have the Strong's number. Someone can Google that quickly for us. But fulfill is le kayem. Le kayem. To abolish is levatel. Levatel. Okay. Leave it, it's fine. Lekayem. This phrase, to fulfill, is the important one. Okay? He says here, well, when you look at it, to fulfill is lekayem, which means to uphold or establish. In Hebrew, this means to establish. But when used correctly in Hebrew, it gives a deeper meaning. I want you to listen to something from Jewish writing. It was just after Yeshua. Uh, it's called Perkei Avot, the wisdom of our fathers. Okay? And what the wisdom of our fathers is, it's one of the tractates in the Mishnah. It's one of the volumes in the Mishnah. And we don't get really stuck in that. The only reason I'm pulling this out is to bring to light this word used in the correct context. It says, yeah, go away to a place of study of the Torah. And do not suppose that it will come to you. For your fellow disciples will fulfill it. Your fellow disciples will lekayem. In your hand and on your own understanding do not rely so this rabbi rabbi nehorai who was alive at about 150 a.d he says go away to a place of study and do not suppose that it will come to you for your fellow disciples will lekayem it to you they will fulfill it to you they will interpret it correctly that is, the, that is what this word means. And I'll give you another one. Whoever lekayem the Torah when poor will in the end lekayem it in wealth. And whoever treats the Torah as nothing when he is wealthy in the end will treat it as nothing in poverty. Yeah, it means to obey. To establish, to obey, to interpret. So, reading from a Hebraic mindset, Yeshua himself is saying, do not think that I have come to bring to naught the Torah, the law, or the prophets. I have not come to bring to naught, but to correctly interpret, but to obey, but to establish. And if we go back and we look at Levatel, Levatel is misinterpreted. It means, it literally means to nullify, to uproot. Jewish understanding, to uproot. And I want, I want to give you a nice example. The law against adultery could be interpreted as cheating, right? On one spouse, but not pornography. Let's just throw this out there. The law against adultery is physically cheating on your spouse. What did Yeshua say about that though? Yeah, just the thought about it. So what are you doing when you're watching pornography? It's the thought, it's the looking at it. He's, Yeshua himself says that's a violation of the commandment. Just thinking about it is a violation of the commandment. In that instance, a rabbi would say that Yeshua is correctly interpreting that commandment. And if a pastor or someone comes up to you and says, don't worry, you can watch X-rated material. A rabbi would say, that man is abolishing that commandment. He's bringing it to naught. Because he's telling you that you can go against it. That's why Yeshua is saying, I've not come to abolish, but to correctly interpret. I've not come to misinterpret, I've come to interpret correctly. So if that is true, if we can understand it in this aspect, it's a bit of a revelation, it's a bit of a, uh, an insight, a bit of an um, adjustment in thinking a little bit, a lot of it. But what it's saying in this context that we are studying today, the Sabbath cannot be abolished. 
Yeshua himself went into synagogue on Shabbat. Paul went into synagogue on Shabbat. The apostles went into synagogue on Shabbat and they also gathered on the first day. We should be mimicking that. I want to paint a little picture for you here. If we think it's abolished, I'm going to draw a timeline. Let's say this is creation. From the beginning of the world to 30 AD, when Yeshua was crucified and resurrected. Do we agree that God cared about Shabbat? He cares. He says, keep my Shabbat. Bad things will happen if you don't keep my Shabbat. Then we come along and we say, from now to when Yeshua comes back, or to present day, let's just say present day, and beyond, to the second coming. Over here, all of a sudden, he doesn't care. But, in the millennial reign, all of a sudden, he cares. And I'll show you why I say that. Jump with me to Ezekiel 46, verse 3. Now, for those that have studied Ezekiel, I don't know where it is. Yeah, um, it's over there. It's over there by your phone. Who's actually gone through Ezekiel? Well, Ezekiel in general. Who studied Ezekiel? From Ezekiel 40 to 47. Who studied that? I have painstakingly. <laughs> It's, it's a lot of detail. Yes, Kelsey. It's a lot of detail. Anyway, to break it down very quickly, Ezekiel 40 to 47, God painstakingly gives Ezekiel the vision of the temple. We, and a lot of people, believe that that temple is, can only be a temple in the millennial reign. It hasn't been built yet. If you look at the sizes, it's clearly not built. If they were to build it in Jerusalem, they would have to flatten that entire mountain. It's massive. Absolutely massive. And it cannot have been built in antiquity. Why? Because it was built out like this. They didn't know how to build that way. So if they didn't build it back then, and we haven't built it yet, we still need to build it according to the scripture, according to the prophets. Otherwise, Ezekiel is a false prophet. A temple, a millennial temple. Now, in Ezekiel 46, this is in the instructions to build this temple. God says, verse 3, 46 verse 3. He says, The people of the land are also to prostrate themselves in worship before Adonai at the entrance to the gate on Shabbat and on Rosh Hodesh, the new moon. So yeah, all of a sudden in millennial reign, which we believe Ezekiel 46 to be, all of a sudden, God brings about Shabbat. He says, from Shabbat, Shabbat, Shabbat to Shabbat, you're going to worship. Jump with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, as well, is millennial reign. Because we're still talking about people coming up against God. We know in the millennial reign, people are against God. We know that. Only after the millennial reign, new heaven, new earth, new creation, everything's hunky-dory, we're back to the Garden of Eden. So, Isaiah 66, verse 22 to 23 says, For just <clears throat> as the new heavens and the new earth that I am making will continue in my presence, says Adonai, so will your descendants and your name forever. Every month on Rosh Hodesh and every week on Shabbat, everyone living will come to worship in my presence, says Adonai. So in this, in this period of millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Yeshua, God is putting importance on Shabbat. In the beginning, He put importance on Shabbat. We cannot say that during this time, He doesn't care about it. It doesn't seem right. Look, we, we need to test everything, right? This is... This is what needs to happen. We need to test everything. We need to... I was taught 
I was taught, don't worry. You don't have to worry about Shabbat. You don't have to worry about certain other things. It's going to be okay. God has placed an importance on Shabbat and one of the most important signs of one of the most important covenants, the Sinai covenant, the sign was Shabbat. That if you keep Shabbat, you will become a peculiar treasure. That word for peculiar treasure is segula. That means that you will be a special treasure to God. Segula literally means a prized possession that a king keeps in the back, protected. Think of end times. He's chosen or protected. He takes, he puts and again, he'll bring it out and he'll show you off. Look at my prized possession. Look at my segula. Don't take my word for it. You guys need to test. You need to look at it. But what we can see, during Yeshua's time, they were using Levital Lekayem in that context. Misinterpret, interpret. So we need to ask ourselves, if Yeshua, and if we read this correctly, that Yeshua didn't come to abolish, but He came to interpret correctly, what does that mean for me? Shabbat, does it stand? Or does it not stand? And this is a personal thing. And this is a personal revelation that each one needs to get. And we need to pray about this. We're not going to go into the next two questions. Because I've spoken way too long. No, we've still got five minutes. I'm going to quickly touch on the last one. Can we keep any day as a Sabbath? I've heard this before, and I've also had the feeling that maybe I can just keep any day as a Sabbath. You know, God will understand if I choose Tuesday. Tuesday is going to be my Sabbath day. Because, hey, I don't work on a Sabbath day on Tuesday. That's not what he says in the Scripture. In Leviticus 23, he says, you'll have a holy convocation on Shabbat. A holy convocation is a, a convocation is a group of people. Holy means a set apart group of people. We'll come together on Shabbat and worship Him. Worship means study, sing, praise. Think about this. If we could keep it on any single day, that would have made a massive difference to the Israelites in the wilderness when they were collecting their manna. Right? God, though, says. Collect your manna on the six days. Go out and work. You physically have to go fetch your own stuff to eat. I'm going to give it to you, but you've got to go fetch it. Sorry for you. There's some action required. But on the seventh day, don't do anything. Even if you go out, it's not going to be there. I love that because he protected them. It was like one of the first few commandments that were self-enforcing. They were self-enforcing. You couldn't break them. If you collected more than you should have, and he said that you shouldn't. Do not collect more than you, you need. If you collect more than you... When you come back to your tent, it's the same as everyone else. Okay, magic. Cool. Do not go out on the seventh day. Whoever went out on the seventh day didn't find any to break the commandment. So he protected them. He was giving them a test run. And uh, the other thing that cemented it for me... So if the seventh day is Shabbat, and God said that, the other thing that cemented it to me, for me is in 150 languages, both ancient and current, Shabbat is Saturday. In Arabic, it's Sabbat. In Armenian, it's Shabbat. In Bulgarian, it's Sabato. Italian, Sabato. Slovak, Sabota. Spanish, Sabada. Ukrainian, Sabuto. Serbian, Sabuto. Somali, Sabti. In 100 to 150 languages. Saturday. Yeah? Yeah? Sabbat. In 100 to 150 languages, Saturday is the Sabbath day. So I just want to lay that out for you. Any questions in closing? And we never got past verse 7. Any questions? We'll do part 3 next week, but we're pretty much done. We're going to finish Acts. We're going to finish Acts 20 next week because there's really not much to talk about after that. And we're going to nail down Acts 22. And we're just going to move forward towards the culmination of Acts where Paul lands up being in Rome. 
and we sort of left on a cliffhanger. What happened to Paul? Why is there no other book? There should be another book. That's how you feel when you read it. Who wants to ask? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was wondering, but how do you know that day one is day one and so on the day two? Like, how do you know that Sunday is day one? You're questioning 150 languages. Questioning 150 languages and you're questioning. Okay, put it this way. In school, guys, in school, sometimes you forget the day, right? And then you ask your friend, what day is it? They're like, it's Thursday. And they correct you. And they're like, it's Thursday, it's the 12th. And you're like, oh yeah. Do you think over a long time, we're going to lose track of the dates? We're going to lose track of the dates? Maybe individually, each one of us might. But as a community, we're self-correcting. Someone's going to know the date. Only 1% of the population is probably going to forget, hey, what day is it? Even if it's 99%, the 1% are correct and you don't believe it, you confirm it. 